Uh, my name is Delina Trache. I am the Native American Student Advocate here at Truckee Meadows Community College. So I'd like to welcome you all and welcome you all with a land acknowledgement. So we acknowledge that Truckee Meadows Community College is situated on the traditional homelands of the Numu, the Northern Paiute, the Wasu, I hope I'm not saying that wrong, uh, the Washo, the Niwi, the Western Shoshone, and the Nuwu, the Southern Paiute peoples. These lands have been a place of gathering for indigenous peoples and we honor the original caretakers. We recognize their deep connection to these places and we extend our, appreciated, our appreciation for the opportunity to live and learn in this space. So with that, I'd like to welcome you all to the event and I would like to welcome our president, Dr. Karin Hilgerson. at this time. Thank you, Delina. She is an amazing and vital addition to the TMCC staff, and I'm so glad you're here. I have the privilege of doing the first of two introductions, uh, and I also had the privilege of getting to know our speaker a little bit last night, and I am so excited. So thank you all for being here. I would like to first acknowledge two special guests, and I know that Diane Cheseldine will acknowledge a few more guests, but I would like to acknowledge Regent Carol Del Carlo. Where did she go? There she is. Thank you for being here the Nevada State System of Higher Education Regent for our area, and former Regent Kevin Melcher, who has also joined us tonight, um, and, we're, and who's also here as a foundation supporter of the 1971 Society. And if you want to learn about that, contact Stephanie or Gretchen. It's amazing. And we appreciate you very much for those 1971 Society members who are here today. In fact, can you raise your hands? These are great supporters of the college, so thank you. We appreciate it. Okay, so now on to our speaker. This is so impressive. And I hope I, I, hope I don't miss anything. Ruby Verdiano, did I say that correctly? Very good. Is a fashion change maker. She is a fashion journalist, storyteller, educator, and speaker whose work focuses on connecting the dots between women's empowerment and sustainable fashion. She promotes diversity, inclusion in the fashion industry. Most recently, Ruby served as a senior manager of storytelling and global content at the Sustainable Apparel Coalition. She has also been a contributing correspondent for NBC News, Nylon Magazine, and Mike.com, and has interviewed designers, Anna, is that Anna Sui? Anna, Anna Sui, Vivian Tam, and Prabal Gurung, among other multicultural designers in the fashion industry. Ruby has worked on the social responsibility team of Moet Hennessy Louis Vuitton group in Paris, where she lived for eight years, by the way. And she told me last night that she went to Paris, she just decided that would be a wonderful city to live, did not speak French. She said it took her five years to become fluent in French. Can you imagine the courage that that would take? Wow. I'm very excited. Yeah, that deserves a round of applause. Anyway, uh, when she was in Paris at Louis Vuitton, she worked on global diversity initiatives. She has also been a blogger for Alicia Keys, one of my favorite musical recording artists, incredible, and an on-camera talent for ABS CBN television. She has a master's degree in global communications from the American University of Paris. So with that, now I'd like to have Diane Cheseldine uh, come up to the stage. Remember, this is her speaker series. Diane brought us this wonderful speaker like she does every year. She manages to find these amazing people to come share themselves with us for a time. So Diane is absolutely incredible. A force of nature is what I like to call Diane. So Diane, where are you? Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Hilgerson. And uh, I'm just, uh, it just warms my heart to see all of you here this evening to share uh, what will be a wonderful and in, in educational evening with us. So thank you so much for being here. Um, this is our 23rd year of, of the series, hard to believe it. And uh, so we're very happy to, to, uh, that you're here to help us celebrate, celebrate our third decade, is that right? 
Okay. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah. thank you, Dr. Hilgerson. I'm the founder of the series, and uh, it's my privilege to um, to introduce to you our guest this evening, who will continue our mission of bringing the world to Reno. Uh, first of all, uh, Dr. Hilgerson, Hilgerson thanked some of our wonderful and special guests. By the way, all of you are special, but I would like to thank the Nevada Humanities for their support of our series. And I also want to give a, a very uh, special thank you to our series committee. They are just uh, astounding. And uh, um, I don't want to miss anybody, but if you see Devin back there with the yellow cravat, he's turning around, Devin. <laughs> he's new to Reno from what I've learned. My goodness, it's just uh, always available. And Barry is our, on our team with the marketing and uh, is some pouring upstairs too. She's multi-talented. And others as well, and Cecilia Vigil. And uh, we have a wonderful uh, committee. I'm just in awe of all the talent. So I want to thank all of you so much. Makes it wonderful for me to work with you. Um, and uh, I met this evening Dr. Deborah Harry. I think uh, Dr. Hilgerson may have uh, acknowledged uh, her. Thank you. Um, from the um, Department of, just a minute, there are three parts to this. The, uh, just a minute, I got my notes out of line. Gender, race, and identity at the university. Thank you so much for joining, uh, joining us. And I apologize if I get my notes a little mixed up, but she's brought a, a guest, I believe, Maori, is that correct? Yes, from New Zealand. and. That's a special delight. I had the pleasure of spending about six weeks in your country two or three years ago. So thank you so much for joining us this evening. Uh, <clears throat> but everybody's special. And I, uh, I thank Dr. Hilgerson for um, telling us about Ruby's uh, wonderful background. So now I'd like to tell you the other part. Uh, uh, I am also a graduate of the American University of Paris uh, a few years before uh, Ruby, but uh, last May, almost a year now, there was a 60-year celebration in Paris of, of the founding of the American Univers University of Paris. So I said, I have to go. That's just what it is. I have to go. And I called a friend of, us, of mine who's with us this evening. I've known since 1958 in Ethiopia, where I used to live, my family lived. I said, you want to go to Paris? Everybody, of course. Right. And so um, we were at, at one of the many wonderful events and uh, meeting people and uh, met Ruby and where are you from and learning a little bit about each other. And uh, when she told me that she, um, uh, <clears throat> her passion is sustainable fashion, of course, I remember that this year, this is the year of sustainability here at TMCC. So I made my moves and I said, uh, would, you, uh, would you possibly, would you, do you speak to Groove? She said she does. And I said, would you consider uh, speaking at my college in Reno, and her answer was, "Wee oui, wee, oui, maybe a <laughs> sou." So um, we kept we communicated over the last few months, and uh, it's really amazing to think that we this started over a glass of wine as we were uh, looking looking across at the San River, and uh, here we are this evening. So it's my great. Um, Great pleasure and delight to introduce Ruby Berriadiano, storyteller, educator, and now I hope to say my friend. So please help me welcome Ruby. Uh, 
Um, I first want to uh, extend my thank you and my gratitude to Diane for inviting me here, for Karen for just being, just giving me such a wonderful welcome to the college, um, and to everyone that I've met here so far. My goodness, Reno, you're making Reno very irresistible. Who would have, you know, I, I, I don't come to Reno very often, but now I um, think this might be a place I frequent. Um, I, the last time I came here, I was a kid, so all I know was Circus Circus, but uh, I'm so glad that I have a more, you know, multidimensional viewpoint of Reno, and this morning I got an opportunity to speak to a classroom, um, and they taught me one thing. They said, okay, if you leave here knowing one thing, you got to know this, and I said, what is that? They were like, you got to call it Nevada, not Nevada. They said they would be very offended, so I said, okay. Oh, wow, okay, that's a uh, unanimous. <laughs> All right, well, that's a, I'm glad that's a crowd pleaser. So I will definitely take that with me and I'll tell everybody, all right, if you're going to go to Reno, you're going to go to Nevada, get it right. All right, so um, that begins my global ambassadorship for your state. Growing up as an Asian American woman in the United States, it was a bit challenging to find accessible role models because there was nobody in the movies or in the books that I read that looked like me. And it was the same in the fashion magazines that I loved to flip through. Even though those magazines were targeted for all young women, I never felt like they were talking to me. And I guess that's why I was inspired to become a storyteller because I wanted to play a part in helping to uplift the voices of the girls who grew up like I did. Today, I work as a writer and fashion journalist in Paris, France. And I think it's so special because in this job, I actually recognize that our clothes tell a story as well. Our clothes have the power to communicate who we are and possibly even what we stand for long before we even say a word. So when I found out more about the fashion industry, I realized that a lot of the people who make our clothes are women. Over 75 million people around the world are garment workers and 80% of that number are women ages 18 to 34 whose voices are disempowered every day at work. What's more, a lot of these women come from Asia in countries like Cambodia, Bangladesh, China, and the Philippines where I was born. It's crazy to think that even though I didn't see a lot of Asian faces in the magazines that I read growing up, a lot of the force behind the industry are actually Asian women who are the makers of our clothes. And that's why I resonated with Remake's mission to turn fashion into a force for good by telling the stories of women in the supply chain. Through films like Made in Cambodia and Made in Sri Lanka, Remake shares stories of women garment workers. And while we women in the West fight for equal pay, freedom from sexual harassment and women's empowerment, our sisters on the other side are fighting the same fight on the factory floor. This is when I realized that sustainable fashion is in fact a feminist issue. As a Remake Ambassador, I serve as a Human to Fashion Correspondent at Paris Fashion Week where I interview designers, models, celebrities, and everyday shoppers about what they think or know about sustainable fashion. I also serve as a speaker and workshop facilitator where I educate uh, young people as well as fashion students and professionals in the industry about the connection between women's empowerment and sustainable fashion. My hope is that people will begin to think about the human hands that make their clothes and to remember that they belong to a woman who is dreaming big dreams and aspiring for a better future just like we are. I encourage you to love your clothes like good friends and to wear your values on your sleeve. Changing our relationship with our clothes is one way to empower women all around the world. Will you join me? anyone else cringes when they hear their own voice on video it's so creepy um, but thank you for bearing with me and thank you for for your for your attention and again your your presence here it's really such a 
uh, a pleasure to have you all. Um, so as uh, Diane had mentioned, TMCC's taken on a year of sustainability, but apparently a century of sustainability is a new commitment, uh, which I love. Uh, but also April is Fashion Revolution Month. I'll tell you a little bit more about that later, but Fashion Revolution Month essentially is a global campaign that generates awareness about the fashion industry. Because when we think about fashion, most of the time we think about the end the, the end goal, the output, right? The, what goes on in the runways, what goes on in the stores, what ends up in our closets. But before the clothes arrive to us um, at the retail shops or in our closet, it goes through such a, an incredible journey. Um, and I just want to tell you a little bit more about what that journey is like today and to really kind of help you understand a more uh, global picture of the fashion industry and hopefully try to co contextualize it to our individual everyday lives. Um, so it was really uh, such a great pleasure that Delina um, agreed to uh, do our land acknowledgement. I actually invited her to do it because I thought it was really important for us to recognize the land that we're on, but also because I truly believe that Indigenous leaders have uh, should have center stage in the climate make the decision-making table when it comes to climate. Um, indigenous leaders have, I think, the strongest wisdom and expertise in terms of how we relate to the planet. And I think that the system that we're living in now in terms of the, the capital and just the overproduction, we have completely disrupted the natural rhythms of how we are supposed to engage with the world around us. So uh, thank you so much for doing that. And again, we'll touch on that again uh, later on in the presentation. But I did want to make sure that I, um, I share that part. So um, a, a little bit about me um, and my relationship to fashion. Earlier today, I asked the students, do they think that fashion is a su superficial subject? Right? And there was like a yes, no, maybe corner. And a lot of people said yes, some people said no, some people said maybe. But I truly believe that fashion can actually be a political and uh, anthropological and cultural statement. You know, it has the power to define eras, right? Like fashion, when we look at the history of fashion, we look at what people are wearing and it's informed very much by what was going on politically, what was going on around the society at the time. And it also, I think, for me, is an opportunity to uh, uh, a form of self-expression and art. It's really about this ability to express my cultural identity through fashion and to represent my heritage through it. So my skirt today is actually made by Filipino artisan weavers. And um, you know, it's really important that we continue to support local indigenous crafts so that they don't die out and that it continues to be relevant in future generations. And there's this company called Ant Hill based out of Cebu, Philippines that works with local um, women weavers and making sure that those weavers have the resources that they need to continue um, their craftsmanship, but also having an, a place to um, have their own economy and to be empowered knowing that they can run their own businesses and that they know how to create this livelihood for themselves and for their families. Um, also, uh, I was born in Manila, Philippines. Um, I'm Filipino and Chinese on my dad's side, or Filipino and then I have, my dad is half Chinese, so I have ch Chinese heritage. And I moved to California when I was 10 years old. And uh, fashion actually helped me learn how to be an American. I studied how to be American through the fashion and what people were wearing. I just remember thinking, I have to have a pair of Converse shoes. Because to me at the time, Converse sneakers felt like the all-American symbol. And again, you know, because fashion is so much about like this cultural reference point, I just learned how to uh, fit in and also like learn how to be myself and my American identity and dual identity at the time. Becoming Filipino American, I learned through the lens of, of fashion and pop culture. So I think that that, that is just a, such a funny memory, but also um, as a woman of color going around the world, um, I'm often in places where there are a lot of uh, foreigners and me becoming a foreigner when I leave the U.S. And there are a lot of moments, especially during the first few years in France, where I couldn't express myself or have a personality. I didn't have a personality in French for like five years. <laughs> uh, but I knew that uh, clothes, uh, my fashion, or just what I chose to wear was an, a way for me to dress how I wanted to be addressed. Um, and it was a form of visual language for me to say, this is who I am. This is how I want you to receive me. And it gave me agency to be able to step into a room and introduce myself before I even had to say anything. So I think that, you know, this is an important way for me also to ambassador my own culture. 
A lot of times people are meeting a Filipino or even an American for the first time. And this is the way that I choose to be intentional about how I carry myself because I know that I'm not just going around the world as myself. I know I'm representing, you know, a community around me. So I think that this is also the way that I see fashion and the way that, um, uh, that, it, that, that it plays a part in my life. I want to ask, raise this uh, so show of hands, who are the students here? Yeah, okay, wonderful. So um, I'm really excited that students are here at this presentation. Um, a lot of times when people find out that I went to school in Paris, that they thought they think I come from a wealthy family. And I just want to debunk that myth immediately um, because I think that sometimes when we don't come from a particular background, we tend to count ourselves out of opportunities. And I didn't choose to do that. I chose to say, you know what, instead of saying, why me? I said, why not me? So if you are a student and you think that you have a goal that you're aiming for, I want you to count yourself in. You know, that's one thing that I want you to walk away with tonight. That's that count yourself into every opportunity, no matter how crazy it sounds, because this should not have been my life. You know, I, I, I don't think that I, didn't, I never thought in a million years that I could go and live in Paris and spend eight years there, and I never thought that that would have been possible. So, um, yeah, so just wanted to get the, those things out of the way and kind of now start into sustainable fashion. So I, uh, had, I started my career in the nonprofit sector. Um, I actually also worked as a performing artist. I worked with um, a lot of arts organizations and youth education programs, bringing the um, arts um, as a form of education to educate young people about race, class, and gender. I was part of a hip hop theater group called Illiteracy. I was a spoken word and performing, performing uh, po a performance artist uh, through spoken word and poetry. And um, back then, like just, you know, I guess it wasn't that long ago, but I guess it feels like a long ago. Uh, uh, woke was not cool, right? Like I had to sell act, I had to trick students into caring about the world. Um, people were, uh, it was a lot harder for me to convince people to care about the planet, to care about social issues. So I felt like I had to wrap the vegetables in the candy and I used art as a way to get them interested and to spark that activism and to build community on campus. Um, and so I think for me as a storyteller, that's a common thread through my entire career journey, using the power of story to galvanize people into action and into impact and getting them to really care because if we're not emotionally connected to a large issue, we don't see how it resonates for us as individuals, we're not going to act. And I think now, Sustainability, we are, we, we're not living like we're in a climate emergency, but we are. Uh, we are, we only have, you know, eight years before the things that we're doing to the planet become irreversible and it's actually quite dangerous. So, um, but I, I, I'm also a climate optimist. So I don't want it to be doom and gloom. I just want people to be inspired by the solutions, but also be, also be very realistic. Um, so, you know, given my background in the nonprofit sector and youth arts education, I wasn't sure how I was going to translate that work into fashion, but I ended up going to school at the American University of Paris and realizing that I could use my, my, my communications uh, strengths to champion this issue in the industry. So um, I, my most recent uh, role was with the Sustainable Apparel Coalition, and that was an opportunity for me to work in the industry, working with brands, retailers, and manufacturers, and trying to unite everybody on a common way to talk about and measure and also create solutions together to move the sustainability agenda forward because it can't operate in silos. People have to collaborate together and it has to be, it's really radical partnership and radical collaboration that's gonna move things forward. So that was the most recent role that I, that I played. And so I think today I, I wanna talk about sustainable fashion and how it's connected to the women's empowerment movement, um, but also first defining what sustainable fashion is. So I, I know I'm, I, I like to improv a lot, so I'm sure my slides are totally, um, uh, uh, out there, but here we go. So what is sustainable fashion? Sustainable fashion is a way in which brands and manufacturers uh, create clothing that is not only, uh, uh, that, that reduces the impact on the environment, but also make sure that they're protecting all the human rights that work in that fashion supply chain. Uh, we are producing so much uh, all the time. And yes, there's an environmental impact, but there's so many human hands behind our clothes. 
Um, and I wanted to make sure that you know that the, the overall thing is, it's not just about buying sustainable brands. Um, that helps, um, but I'm going to show you what it, the broader definition of sustainable fashion. And I, I definitely um, do believe that we should be supporting sustainable brands where we are, but there is a global picture of the fashion supply chain that I just want to make sure that I tell the full story of. So let's see here. So the fashion supply chain refers to the whole process of, you know, how the clothes end up in our, in our closets, right? It's not just um, every piece of clothing starts off as a crop first or a natural, you know, element, right? Um, cotton and linen and silk, they're all made from natural materials, wool as well. And then you have things like polyester that's derived from fossil fuels and essentially made out of plastic. Um, but it also a useful fabric because it lasts for a very long time. Um, but we have to be aware of that. So there's steps to the fashion supply chain that goes from raw materials to the actual production process down to the distribution. And I kind of want to flush that out a little bit more for you. So to break it down, so again, as I mentioned, um, every uh, piece of clothing starts off as a raw material first. I'm sorry if it's a little hard to see it, um, but you know, you first, you, so the, the, the impact starts long before they become clothes. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of work that goes into growing crops that go into um, extracting these natural resources. So that's already another environmental impact that we're, we haven't even thought about because that happens before it becomes a piece of clothing. And then you go into the um, design and the material production. Now, here's a fun fact. Sustainability actually starts off in the design process. So if anybody here aspires to be a fashion designer, um, fashion designers have to be educated now about how their design decisions impact how this is, how sustainable the product is. You know, even the way that they, the, the, the materials that they choose, the kind of stitching that they, they want to employ into the fabric, those are all things that get, um, have an impact in the production process, right? So if the design is hard on the hands, for example, they have to take that into consideration, but it's, it's really starts at the design process. But the material production, I went to visit a factory, a textile factory in Spain last year, and I was just uh, shocked and also a little bit horrified at how much uh, resources go into just making the, the textile itself because it takes up a lot of water um, and it also the dyes are very harmful and there's a lot of chemicals that go into the dyeing process. Now fortunately there, this factory that I visited in Spain they had a whole system uh, employed within the factory that helped them to make sure that the water can be re redistributed back to the natural resources because they had a cleansing process within that factory. And then they also had ways to um, reduce the impact of their dyes. Um, I think they were using some kind of other technology where instead of using dyes, they used something else. But, you know, it, it just kind of opened my eyes to like, oh my gosh, before it actually becomes a, a, a shirt, the fabric itself takes up so much um, natural resources and labor and um, the, the environmental impact of that is, is actually quite large. And so that, that was eye-opening for me to see that. Um, however, uh, oh, so, so I just wanna share that, you know, the textile production part is very resource inten intensive. It's high greenhouse emissions, air contamination, and high use of fresh water supplies. But again, I'm a climate optimist, so I'm gonna tell you the good news. The good news is that some brands are now following the slow fashion approach. More on that later, but kind of akin to the slow food movement, right? There's also the slow fashion movement. But many brands are also adopting the cradle to cradle approach. And what that means is that, you know, there's a biological uh, cradle to cradle approach where they're able to actually um, create products that will then be able to be biodegradable so that it can be returned back to the natural environment seamlessly and with less impact. So that's one uh, area of improvement. The second uh, one is the industrial approach where they are reusing the products and recycling the fabrics to make new ones. So instead of having to use new materials or virgin materials, they call it, they're able to then take old materials and find a way to process those fabrics to make new ones. So that's great news, right? Um, and then, uh, so, so that's the, the, the production uh, design and the production process 
of the materials. And then we go into the, produ the production of the actual clothes, right? So then it gets shipped off to the manufacturing uh, warehouses or the factories, and that's where the assembly of the clothes actually uh, take place. And this is the part that I'm going to talk about today because, as I mentioned in the little intro video, um, a lot of the, w women, the people making our clothes are actually women. Uh, women between four, ages 14 to 34, and they're uh, severely impact, impacted by the fashion supply chain. Um, and th that's where millions of them are being employed now. Um, so more of that later. And then there's a delivery uh, uh, part of it, of it. Like right, once the clothes are being made, there's a, the environmental impact of having to ship those products to the various retailers or warehouses all around the world. And that creates also its own carbon footprint. So that's important to note. And then this is the part that involves all of us and all of you is the part where it reaches the customers. When it reaches the customers, we have a responsibility to make sure that we are taking care of our clothes um, and not throwing them away in the landfills and making sure that we're creating um, really smart decisions when we're purchasing uh, clothes so that it is actually conscious of the environment and also uh, remembering of, uh, and, and, and honoring the human hands that actually made them. Right, so we'll talk more about that later on, but I just wanted to give you a little overview of the complexity of the fashion supply chain because um, this is kind of like the simple, basic overview, but in reality, the fashion supply chain is like an eight-headed monster. There's a lot of middlemen, so it's actually really hard to trace it. So now there's a lot of new policies that are um, asking companies to trace their supply chain. And it's getting harder and harder to do that because it's just evolved into this uncontrollable monster. And so now, but it's never been regulated before. The fashion industry has never been regulated. So they've been able to get away with, you know, the sweatshop factories and so forth because nobody's checked on them. No one's asked, how are these clothes made? Can you provide proof? But that's slowly changing. So um, I just wanted to also uh, share that, you know, in the last two decades, fashion has increased in speed, uh, which has sped up the volume in which the industry produces clothes. So I, I mentioned the term slow fashion earlier and made it akin to slow food, where fast fashion is like fast food. Um, so this is kind of where, um, you know, uh, the, the clothes like the H&Ms, the Zara's, uh, the kind of the Walmarts, right? They kind of fall into the fast fashion umbrella. Are you a bad person if you wear H&M? Absolutely not. Um, but I will show you later on like how you can be smarter about your fast fashion choices as well. But it is very harmful for our planet because we're overproducing at a very scary rate. And you know, if, if you ask me, I don't think that we need to produce any more new stuff. You know, we produce enough stuff to last us generations. And I, I think the way to do it is just to kind of con continue giving clothes and things new lives and um, really asking ourselves, do we need this? Um, because we don't need to be consuming all the time. So as I mentioned earlier, before your clothes reach you, the garment goes through hundreds of pairs of human hands, and not to mention water, chemicals, crops, um, oil, and so much more. So it's a very resource intensive industry. It's one of the most polluting industries in the world, um, but it's pretty, right? So I think that for so long, what we focused on is the end product, like how wonderful it looks on the runway. And fashion is a source of beauty and a, and a source of inspiration, but I think we also have to be realistic about what um, the, the, the real journey, the full picture of fashion. Um, so just to sum up, the definition uh, for me in regards to sustainable fashion actually comprises of three different uh, layers. One is the environmental uh, aspect of it. So, um, you know, just wanting to read here that the textile industry is estimated to use 378 billion liters of water annually, um, using up to 200 liters of water to process, dye, and finish each kilo of textiles. That is from the World uh, Wildlife Federation. And then um, and a social aspect as well. Like, you know, there's a lot of human, as I keep mentioning, there's a lot of humans that make our clothes or that are in the production process. And according to the International Labor Organization, which is an, uh, the ILO, which is an organization uh, from the UN, um, almost 21 million people of the world are victims of forced labor, and 11.4 of, of these are women and girls. Um, and then it's also cultural. 
Um, as I mentioned earlier, there are a lot of traditional crafts that are going extinct, and cultural sustainability is the work of making sure that we are preserving the artisanship and the craftsmanship. Um, when I was covering Paris and New York Fashion Weeks for um, NBC, uh, I got to meet a lot of small independent designers who were championing this uh, ability to, you know, to make sure that their traditional crafts were being preserved and being relevant to the next generation. Because, you know, fun fact that I uh, found out about is that uh, the kimono is actually in danger of going extinct in a single generation. That's quite scary uh, because it's a very slow process to make kimono. And the young people don't want to take that time consuming uh, process anymore, but it's about making sure that we teach future generations the relevance um, of this cult, of these cultural um, movements and, and so that we can preserve them and that we don't lose the richness of, of the culture as the generations pass. Um, so that, that's an overview of sustainable fashion and how all the different layers that, that, that uh, take up what it means to be, sustain, to be sustainable in the fashion industry. Um, I also really believe, as you had mentioned, uh, as I mentioned also in the video, that sustainable fashion is a BIPOC feminist issue. And I say that because most of the women that are impacted by the fashion supply chain are women that come from the global south. Um, there's a lot of, uh, you know, black and brown women and that are impacted by the fashion supply chain. And again, also so many indigenous communities that are in danger uh, because of the environmental impact of fashion. Um, and so I, this is kind of the, the dots that I want to connect here today. Um, so my entry point uh, to the fashion industry and why I got very interested in it is actually because of a video that I'm going to show you next. I saw this video and I thought, oh my gosh, I can't unsee this. Um, and this is the reason why I became involved. So I'll just play this video for you. And before I, I share this video, um, again, it's a kind of a, a really kind of a um, opening. Uh, uh, it opened my eyes when I realized, my goodness, you know, the women that make our clothes, the demographic is 18 to 35. It's a similar demographic to the women that buy those clothes um, on our side of the world. So I think it's really important to connect all the women um, from different parts of the supply chain to really understand that actually we have so many similar um, uh, dreams and aspirations, but also fighting the same fight. And we need to be able to um, learn about them and to highlight their story because for so long they've been hidden from the industry. Um, so I think that you know my goal for this evening is just to kind of highlight uh, the, the, the invisible people that make fashion actually possible for us. So here we go. Fashion I use as a tool to communicate topics or issues that I care about. I think fashion is like a big system that affects many different parts of people's lives. It affects money, it affects politics. I think there's room for change in the way that we make our clothes. More ethical and sustainable ways is a way that I want to participate in fashion. It's amazing. I have only been to Canada before, so it'll be definitely a different experience. I'm still in the phase of like, oh my god, this is happening. I'm just really excited to see how things are run over there. Right there. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> the mobri leaf is the only one food for the sick one. How much salt do you produce from one like one cocoon? Yeah. Actually, from one cocoon we can take four hundred meters. So this is just a small sample, right? There's yeah, more. Yeah, this is the showroom. They had a big factory and open Monday to Friday. Knowing the statistics and actually seeing the people that these numbers represent was very different. Hi. <laughs> My name is Ali. What is your name and your age? I want to talk to you about your experience working here. What did you do there? Do you support anyone with like family with your um, salary here? Hearing their stories and seeing that they're more than just the number was something that was really eye-opening. Just like want to hear about their stories and why they were fired. <laughs> Somebody and people want cheap clothing but they don't think about the ramifications of that and the wages that these people making our clothing um, are paid. The amount of hands just in production, not in sourcing, not in packaging, not in retail, just production to produce you know, a five dollar shirt. Thom hay ai kha thom pe chang o nang thiu nang miet pan na ban sli khao nang tru. That's funny because I think of like that too when, especially the small sizes, like who actually wears this. You know, we think about the same things. I'm a first generation Vietnamese American, which I think is very important to myself as a designer. I have aunties in Vietnam who have like worked in factories or done production like offsite. <laughs> oh, look at this one. She's very pretty. Chang dang bido wat ti tam sat na o na. Ti rum da be ta ni and that was when he was in the army. 
the pay. She's been working a second job, and her 14-year-old daughter sees her suffering, and she wanted to stop going to school and work in the garment industry as well. But her mom was just like, no, like don't do that. Like she's sacrificing her well-being so that her daughters can have a better future. There's no easy answer, but seeing the women and how strong they are and that they're fighting for themselves. Going back to Parsons to impact immediate change, I think the best thing for me to do is just to get the word out to every all the other designers that there's this whole other world to garment making production. <laughs> We need to have more conversations and systematic changes and have these discussions in schools and start thinking about them so that the future of the industry can, you know, be aware of this and start to make changes. Facebook? Oh, oh my Facebook. It's just been a very eye-opening experience. And a lot to handle, but hopefully um, we can help people understand and make change. I think when it comes to like, you know, um, uh, the folks who are our educators, right? Um, I think that every person who wants to go into a career in fashion should watch a video like this, especially those who are fashion designers, because there's actually needs to be a whole reformation of how we educate fashion students so that they can make better decisions. The the uh, young women in these video in the video, they were Parson Design students, so they were able to understand. Oh, my design de decisions actually impact people in a very real way. So I think as we are really thinking about sustainability and looking to improve it, we need to start educating fashion professionals differently and making them aware of how this issue takes place. And, you know, just again, like there, uh, you know, a few years ago when we were fighting the Me Too movement, they were also doing the same thing because they, they have to deal with sexual harassment on the factory floor. You know, we're talking about pay equity. I mean, there's a difference between minimum wage and living wage. And most garment workers are being paid the minimum wage, which is what is legal, but that is not a living wage. That means that they are not able to actually have the comforts of their of actually being able to um, earn uh, a living that will actually provide for their family and lift them out of poverty. So these are very important things to, to think about. And um, I don't know if you could read all of that, but I'm not gonna read all of it because we're running low on time. But one of the things that really uh, struck me was learning that Asia is essentially dubbed as the garment factory of the world. Most of the manufacturing, um, most manufacturing countries are in Asia and being of Asian heritage, this is something that really uh, resonates and speaks to me and why it's so important to me. Um, but also the fact that we can't deny that um, uh, the history of colonialism is actually what's allowed these systems to be perpetuated, right? When uh, when when countries who were once colonized lose and and their resources have been extracted, they are dependent on these big multinational companies for even if the labor is cheap, this is the way that they're able to employ their people. And unfortunately, some countries really exploit that. And uh, I, you know, I think that it's it's time that we reform the, the fashion system and, and make the fashion system more accountable, so that we're they're creating jobs that lift people out of poverty instead of perpetuating the cycle of poverty, because that's all a minimum wage is doing is perpetuating those systems. 
and uh, we're not changing anything. And even to this day, when I visit, I was just in my home country of the Philippines in January. And to this day, you still very much feel the presence of the colonial influence in present day in every crevice of society. So um, just so, some, something important to, for me to share. Um, and I want to go into, uh, oh, so this is a, another thing, a quote by Greenpeace. Um, another thing to think about is um, how colonialism impacts the fashion industry. So it's very much embedded in the fashion uh, production process. Even the term waste colonialism. I don't know, raise your hand if you've heard of the term waste colonialism. Um, essentially, it's the practice of shipping off all of our landfill waste to other countries. Um, and we, we, are, we, we create our own waste, and so we ship them off to countries that, oh, oh, why don't you take our trash? And then now, all of a sudden, those countries are dealing with our landfill, and you know, there's, uh, I don't remember which country specifically it is, but there are certain countries that take um, like million, 14 million tons of uh, used clothing from Western countries. What are they gonna do with that? You know, only a small percentage of that goes into the secondhand market, but the rest of it just infiltrates their own environment because climate change impacts us differently depending on where we live, right? And the global north has depended on uh, these formerly colonized countries to take on that burden and perpetuating this environment where they're living very uncomfortably. Um, but here we are continuing to consume everything and living very comfortably with all of our stuff. Um, but you know, I, I just, it's just, it's just crazy <laughs> how, how much all of it is just embedded and how this, this system is, is still very much, um, very archaic, but very present and alive today. Uh, so Rana Plaza is something that I really want to talk to you about. This is what actually kicked off uh, the fashion revolution movement. This happened in April 24th, I believe in 2013. Essentially a watershed moment in the fashion industry where um, a factory um, in Bangladesh where more than 5,000 people work making clothes for some of the biggest brands, that factory collapsed. And the workers kept ringing the alarm saying, hey, we don't think it's safe here, but they were forced to go into work. And a lot of the, most of the victims were young women. So again, you know, this is, you know, we're putting, these are the women who are making our clothes are on the front line of the climate crisis, but also the human rights crisis. And this was something that they couldn't hide, right? Uh, a lot of uh, fashion brand uh, tags were found in the rubble. So they really couldn't hide from that. Um, so I think that this has become much more of an industry priority ever since this happened, this watershed moment in, in the fashion industry. And that's what it, that's the origin of Fashion Revolution Day. So uh, April 24th is the official Fashion Revolution Day, and it's a global movement to uh, galvanize consumers because consumers were the missing piece, right? We have social media now. We can actually advocate and ask brands ourselves through social media, and it works. You know, uh, I work uh, as a, you know, working in the marketing communications function in, you know, sustainable fashion um, industry brands, they have data insights on what people post on social media. And so when they use that data to, um, to think about what decisions they're going to make next. And so if you, if you have like 50 followers, right, and you don't think your little post or your little opinion matters, I'm here to tell you that it actually does, you know, because again, it funnels into the data insights of, you know, okay, here's a demographic of people that think about, think this way about this topic. And, you know, so their, their priority is understanding what do consumers think? What is the consumer's priority? And they make decisions based on what we care about. So you have power as consumers to ask the brands. And I think Fashion Revolution Day really started to to like really galvanize people to like tag their favorite brands on Instagram, on Twitter, on Facebook, to ask them who made my clothes. And this movement is what started to spur the, 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 the industry thinking like, oh wow, we can't hide from this anymore. And as long as they know that we care, they're going to start to care because your, the way that you care affects the way that they make money. Right. And unfortunately, that's what shifts decisions. So it is an opportunity for us to um, recognize the, the, the humans behind, of our, behind our clothes and really a really easy way for us to hold brands accountable and to create that conversation globally, um, even from where you sit right now. Um, and, you know, I, I want to also share that um, 
there is an account called Intersectional Environmentalist. And I think that there is such a, I think even the way that I told this story to you today was very intentional in making it very intersectional so that it is coming from a, um, a lens that you know provided you with gender and and race and class uh, in 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 the climate movement because in the beginning I didn't think that I cared that much about the environment I was like I have more important things to worry about I have to think about you know uh, you know actual humans but hello humans live in the environment and we have to make sure that we are all caring about it but we're not going to care about a movement if we are not including um, leaders who look like all of us in the in the in the center stage of these conversations we need everybody all hands on deck to act against climate change and it's going to take every single person but if not everybody is um, is, is seeing how it affects their local communities, no action gets taken. So I really, uh, if you have the opportunity to check out this um, uh, Instagram account, please do. There's so many different tools to uh, really think about how do we talk about climate, how do we talk about the environment in a way that's inclusive of all of the people um, around the world that are affected by it and centering those voices. Um, and speaking of centering these voices, I'm so excited that this cover came out in time. Um, my home country, uh, the Philippines, uh, we have a Vogue Philippines now. And for the April cover, it came, again, it came right on time. I was so happy to see it. And this was actually something that was super powerful to me. Vogue, uh, the April 2023 uh, uh, issue of Vogue Philippines centers an indigenous woman. And this actually brought me to tears, seriously. It, it brought me to tears because we, as a, uh, as a nation, we have all, we, uh, there's been a lot of history of colonization in the Philippines. I don't know if you know, but the Spanish was there for 300 years and then the Americans came. And so there's just been this like cla uh, classism, but colorism at the same time. And there's just been this kind of erasure of indigenous people's voices. And so for Vogue Philippines to make this statement and to center this woman, um, this, uh, this woman here is Apo Wang Ud. She is 106 years old. So she is also the oldest woman to appear on Vogue. Um, she is a uh, tattoo artist. One of the few, one of, she's actually the only remaining tattoo artist of her tribe and uh, a Kalinga tattooist. So um, it's, I don't know if you've seen it before, but you know, it's like the, the tribal tattoos in the Philippines are done with like kind of sticks, kind of, I don't know how to describe it uh, accurately, but it's just ink and like some sticks and you pound it onto the skin and she is the master of that. And now she's training her nieces to make sure that her nieces can pass that on because at 106 years old, um, we don't know how long we get to have her, but she's our national treasure. And again, the power of, you know, inclusive storytelling. This was when it, it launched, I just, you know, it felt like an earthquake in a good way. And this was a sign that, you know, the tide is changing, that we're able to really step into this uh, new era um, together. So I, I don't know, we're not going to have enough time to play my video, unfortunately. But I will, um, I want to go into the solutions. I have like six minutes, my goodness. So what can we all do to become a fashion change maker? So one thing is, you know, I want to invite you all to just wear and care for the clothes you already own. And, you know, buying secondhand and vintage is actually a really, really wonderful um, thing to nor normalize, right? Uh, I think in some countries, they think that buying secondhand or vintage is like, icky but i'm like do you know how many chemicals and oils go into your clothes before it reaches you that's pretty icky too so i think really about giving um the practice of giving our clothes a, a second life is really one of the things that's going to help change the industry also normalizing repair and mending some people they get a hole in their clothes and then they're like oh this is no good anymore no we gotta we gotta repair it and mend it just like our grandparents did um, and making sure that we're treasuring our clothes of course, supporting local and sustainable brands is always going to be helpful, but I don't want that to be the only solution, right? Because there are more ways to, and let's be real, sustainable brands, they are made with different quality, so they have a, a justified price tag, but not everybody can uh, access that. So I think 
being if you if if the only solution we have is to buy sustainable brands is actually an elitist perspective. So I, I I just wanted to put that out there. I think if you can do it, that's wonderful. But it should be something that you know we don't put pressure on all of us to do because some people are like, oh my gosh, I'm still wearing my H and M clothes. Am I a bad person? I'm like absolutely not. I still wear my H and M clothes. They were probably bought like you know 10 years ago. But hey, if it's still in good condition, I'm gonna keep wearing them. Um, and then consider renting uh, special occasion dresses. Those are the things that I uh, do. Like instead of buying a whole new thing for something that I'm only going to wear once or twice, I just rent it. And then a little thing, a very easy thing, is the 30 wears rule. When you are at a store and you see something that looks very like lovely or like you know uh, shiny, you have to ask yourself: Can you commit to actually wearing that garment or that shoe at least 30 times? That's a good filter to know whether or not you actually need it or love it, because um, that's going to also determine how long it stays in your closet. So I hope um, you know these little small tips can help. But as consumers, we have to be educated, but we also have to have the responsibility of caring for our clothes um, and not uh, treating them as disposable items that we forget about or you know that we just let go of once they're not perfect anymore. Um, and I also want to e emphasize that we are no longer just consumers, but we ha we're living in an era, not just with the climate crisis, but just in their general world. In, you know, just a, there's a lot of stuff that happens in our world, and we have to transform from not only consumers, but to active citizens and active global citizens as, at that, right? Because we have to really think about um, the world that we're creating together and, uh, and, and understanding what choices that we're making to ensure that other people can enjoy uh, the world as much as we do. So, you know, we have to participate in the legislation process by advocating for bills, calling our elected officials and exercising our rights to vote. I did want to inform you that there are certain policies. Uh, this is my the climate optimist part. Um, there are policies that are actually being um, uh, in process right now in the United States. There is a New York Fashion Sustainability and Social Accountability Act. It's one of the first US laws aimed at large fashion companies and they're demanding now for transparency. You know, if you wanna do business in New York, which is a fashion, one of the fashion capitals of the world, uh, you gotta show proof, you know, that you are actually participating in the due diligence of environmental and social responsibility through reports, through data and full disclosure. That's a big deal. And another one is um, the Fabric Act, which is a federal law. The federal law, the Fabric Act, actually now um, uh, outlines pay protection for workers nationwide while eliminating the piece rate um, situation. You know, a lot of garment workers are paid per piece. That makes no sense. It, they have to transform that into an hourly wage. And again, making sure that hourly wage is uh, a living wage, not a minimum wage. And then in California, right next door to you, is a Garment Worker Protection Act that was signed into law in October of 2022. And that um, allows more than 45,000 workers to receive a minimum wage of $14 an hour. Um, and the key points of this legislation is that fashion brands will now be responsible for wage theft violations. So if you are a fashion brand um, and you are working with a factory that's not paying their garment workers fairly, you now have to pick up that bill. So there are a lot of policies and it's just not in the US, there's a lot more in Europe. So I think that we are, um, there is movement happening um, because now there's incentives for businesses to actually participate because it's becoming into law. Um, but again, as consumers, we have to advocate for these laws to be passed um, and making sure that we are participating as active citizens. Um, I wanted to share a video, but I can't. But uh, do I have the time? <laughs> do we have the time? Okay, okay. So I wanted to bring it back um, to um, what I said earlier about, you know, um, uh, indigenous leaders being really like the, they should be the, the center point for, for uh, the climate situation and the sustainability conversation. And I had, um, during the pandemic, I launched this 
project, a very special project. It was like a podcast project called Grit and Glamour. And it was essentially like the grit behind the glamour of the fashion industry, but also the grit behind the glamour of all of our journeys, right? And I got an, an uh, opportunity to invite uh, a Native American uh, designer, Delina White, um, on the show. And I just wanted to share a small clip with you because I think that um, we should hear her voice and she works in fashions and it was such a pleasure to interview her. So I'll go ahead and, and play it for you. Well, Delina, I'm so excited to have you on the show today. Um, before we get started, I'd love it if you could share a little bit more about you. You've already shared where you're from, but maybe you can share with us um, a little bit more about how your upbringing has inspired the work that you do today. Sure. Um, I learned how to do beadwork from my grandmother, my maternal grandmother. Her name is Maggie King. She lived to be 94 years old and she was a master beadwork artist, but she didn't realize or she would never call herself a master artist, but she was. And she taught me how to do beadwork and I throughout my life have done beadwork, but it's only been recently, like September of 2014, that I received a huge grant and I decided to be an artist full time. So mm -hmm. I am taking my beadwork and I'm creating fabric from it. So I'm, I'm always based in my traditional foundations of um, my values, beliefs and culture, but I'm also making things, clothing that's relevant to today. So it's contemporary, mixing contemporary with traditional. Yes. And tell us a little bit more about your design philosophy, because I've read that you do prioritize a uh, gender fluid clothing. And how does that intersect with your identity um, as a Native woman? Mm -hmm. Well, my design philosophy is based on the seven values of the Anishinaabe culture. And Anishinaabe is the name of, the, of my tribe of what um, my tribal nation of what we call ourselves. Um, we're also known as Ojibwe in Chippewa, but mm. we call ourselves Anishinaabe. And our seven values are honesty, um, love, kindness, and well, just really based on love. And mm. so it's about creating um, art for the community. And, and it's my community wants to show pride in their cultural heritage and we can do that by the clothing that we wear and when i talk about fashion apparel and being a fashion designer you know a lot of people think of it as something that's luxurious but they don't realize that everybody is participating in fashion like every morning when you wake up and you go to the closet and you think about what am i going to wear today what type of a statement do I want to give people a message to send people about myself? Am I going to be in a meeting? Do I need to be strong? Do I need to be uh, a little more loving? Do I need to be um, ready for the day? And my daughter says yeah. when she's, you know, ready to be a strong woman warrior, she wears her red lipstick. <laughs> <laughs> I think we got the same idea today. <laughs> yes, me too. <laughs> so, um, so that's the philosophy, uh, and um, including our two spirit community, which is the LGBTQ, and then two spirit is what the Native people call themselves, who are um, both male and female, or whatever their gender identity is, mm. and. And I believe, you know, because of our seven values based on love, that we include everybody in our community and everything that we do. So I always use um, two spirit models, whether it's a male who who identifies as a female or a, or a female who identifies as a male, or you know, the the vast um, range of of uh, gender identity. And it's just a part of being inclusive about who we are and that everybody needs to appreciate one another. Yeah, and I love that finally fashion is catching up to these values that I think it seems like has already been embedded in your cultural, you know, kind of uh, upbringing that these are things that you honor and 
uh, these are I the identities, uh, different gender identities are things that you naturally respect and honor in people. And I think that in the last few years, there's been more of a conversation around that in the fashion industry. Um, and I'm excited to be able to include your voice in that because it's, it seems like this is something that you've invested in, um, not even even before you were you became a fashion designer. So yes, absolutely. And it's about loving your community and everybody who is a part of that community. And my nation, all nations of native people have um, never ostracized or excluded anybody from the community. And we mm -hmm. participate and love each other as family members and everybody participates in the family and gives what they can to the best of their ability. And we recognize that and appreciate it and honor it. I wanted to end on that note because I just wanted to, you know, end with a statement that sustainability is in essence an act of love. Um, you know, I think it's we have to start to act like we live in a global village. We li that we we have to have this act. like Delina, even though I come from a different cultural upbringing, like culturally and personally, community is such a big value for me. And until we start to act as a community, nothing is going to change. So I think that this is what I want to leave you with. But I also want to invite the other, your Delina, uh, back up to the stage to number one, um, share her uh, response to the video, but also to help close this out properly. So thank you all. All right, that was such an empowering and informative uh, presentation and definitely a new uh, perspective towards fashion and sustainability. Um, personally, I actually do know Delina White. I've met her before through um, traveling through North America for powwows. So I'm really happy that she showed that video on her. Um, and I could relate to a lot of what um, <laughs> our guest speaker has said, and what Delina has said, um, because of who we are, um, our communities and our families mean so much to us, and especially representing ourselves in these Western um, schools and places that are outside of the reservation, we definitely want to represent our families, and we want to represent our, our tribes. So pretty much what I'm wearing is all Native American garments made from very recognized people within um, the Native American community and across Indian country is what we call it. So the necklace I'm wearing um, is from a man from the Coast Salish tribe. So they use a lot of the dentenlium, which comes from the ocean. Um, and we adorn ourselves with this and it kind of, um, I guess, creates status. Um, the earrings I made are from a lady in Oklahoma, but her husband is Cree and I'm also Cree. Um, so we create things that represent where we come from. So my earrings, um, I really love them because our people ate ber berries. We ate things from the land. Um, so I really love that they were strawberries also because I love strawberries. <laughs> but, um, and the skirt itself, um, was made by Noah Pino. Um, he's from Montana, I'll show it. So, um, it was pretty interesting recently, uh, Kate Spade came out with a skirt, pretty similar, it wasn't ribbon, but it was printed exactly like many of the skirts that Noah Pino had made. So there was a big um, outpour from the Native American community over social media of cultural appropriation. Um, they didn't, they started deleting comments from their post of their, um, their advertisement of that Kate Spade dress. So I thought that was pretty interesting. And I, of course, commented. I was like, that looks like um, a Noah Pino skirt. And I got a lot of feedback and people started commenting. And, but it just shows how, um, I guess, how, uh, what she said, how um, much we, influence um, the outside world with um, our culture, um, our heritage, and I guess the impact we can have and we, um, 
influenced in that way. But I just wanted to thank her um, for bringing a lot of these important topics up and including um, myself and my people in this space. Um, I really appreciate that, and I do have a gift for her. I beaded her some earrings, so oh, it's also from um, also from the Distinguished Speakers Series Committee. I just became a part of the club, so I'm happy about that. So thank you for including me. Um, they're really encouraging people, so I'm excited to help with whatever um, projects they have up ahead. Um, and I just want to thank you again for including me in this. Yeah, um, including the indigenous representation. That means a lot to me. Um, so the, we're going to be closing with a um, native prayer song from my people. Um, it definitely talks about, I guess, our grandmothers who have gone on um, being with us and just supporting us through life. So you can relax, close your eyes, you don't have to stand up and just... We're going to end on a really powerful uh, note here, so. Thank you guys, and thank you guys for coming. Again, I'd like to say thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Oh my. <laughs> It'd be nice to have some quiet time for all of us now, but we would like to invite your questions because in case there are some from the audience and take advantage of uh, Ruby's passion and her immense knowledge. So um, let's see here. Anybody have a question in mind? Oh, okay, <laughs> I have to choose then, right? This is like selecting a student, right? <laughs> okay, so, I'll select I'll Leslie. Oh, oh, uh, oh, look at Devin. Devin, <laughs> oh, Devin, please, will you just take care of this? <laughs> so um, I'm familiar with B Corp. Mm -hmm. Is there any effort to come up with standards that go throughout the whole supply chain yes. along the lines of that? Or is B Corp applicable because you yes. went over the whole complexity of the supply chain, which is quite unique? Um, if you could talk about that. Thank you. Yeah, um, so um, definitely a lot, some fashion brands are actually under B Corp. Uh, now, so Chloe, one of the largest fashion brands in Paris, um, recently became a B Corp company. And there are um, the Sustainable Paris Coalition, the um, industry association, association that I was just a part of, they are working to create standard measurements. Um, and again, the policy work is also creating all of this, these new standards. Um, that's a lot of things are still in the works, but definitely influenced by policy there are going to have to be some uniformed, you know, even like the nutrition labeling type of thing. Um, that is something that is coming out. Um, and then in terms of the B Corp uh, or something that is comparable to B Corp, I think that that's definitely on the way. Um, I don't know all the complexities and in, in and ins and outs and the technicalities of it, but what I can say is a short answer is that that's definitely in the works and in progress. And already fashion brands are entering kind of the B Corp umbrella and following those um, those standards. Do you know, just as a follow-up, do you know if the B Corp or those fashion brands extend to the production of the fabric? You know what? I don't know that answer, but I will have to look that up and hopefully get back to you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Next question. Oh, hello, Elena. All right, I'll come over to you right now. All right. <laughs> Well, thank you. This was fantastic. I took a bunch of pictures of the slides and I'm sending them straight to my kids. You know, <laughs> I have two teenage girls, so very, very pertinent topic. As an average consumer, um, how is there a quick and easy way for me to know if a brand is sustainable? Yeah, I think that that's g getting tricky because so many brands are saying that they're sustainable, but I think it's really about um, Quick and easy is going to be a little bit difficult because I think there's a lot of greenwashing right now. So I think one of the key things to look out for is if you look in their website, is there, is there actual data? Uh, because a lot of com uh, companies who are serious about their carbon footprint and measuring all of the ways that they're doing the due diligence on social environmental impacts, they have the data to be able to um, prove that these claims are actually accurate. So not everyone has data. So some people will just be like, oh, we're sustainable, but in what way? You have to kind of see like, uh, what are the different um, specific initiatives? Is it circularity? Is it, is it recycling? Is it water? So I think one of the ways that you could tell if they are being serious is having to do a little bit of research for now because the, 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 um, the tags and all the labeling, it's still in process. Those are still being standardized and regulated and it's still in progress. But for now, if you want to know, there's also an app called Good On You. Um, it's an Australian app uh, or an Australian company. Um, and you could start, they, they've rated all of the different brands. So it's a good way for you as a consumer if you're at the store and you wanna just see like, oh, I'm considering buying Levi's, how does good on you rate Levi's? And then they break it down to all of the different aspects that they consider sustainable, and they're able to provide a score for you. And you can decide as a consumer if that score is good enough uh, for, for you and your purchase. Yeah, hopefully that helps. All right, one or two more questions, and then we're going to begin Leslie? wrapping it up. Yeah, I just I have a comment. Just thank you for giving people my knowledge about this whole subject. I thought when I talked to you last night that it was only about companies that were using recycled products to make their their products, but 
I also wanted to say a couple days ago, I saw maybe some of you saw it the, the, um, on the news about Pendleton. And we all know Pendleton as a very um, well-known product in America and especially coming from Oregon. They had a big segment on Pendleton employing Native American indigenous people of that area to come up with designs for their clothing mm. and telling stories through their clothing now. And it just really gave, was so heartwarming to see that because it's about what you're talking about tonight, culturally, including those indigenous people from that area. So I just thought it was so uplifting to hear your story tonight. And thank you for increasing my knowledge. Thank you. Thank you so much. Is there somebody else? All right. Now's your chance. This is our last question here. Oh. So, <laughs> save the best. Save the best. I'm not for going last. to finish that. <laughs> Ruby, thank you so much for coming. It's been a pleasure to see you. <laughs> so, um, Ruby and I used to work together at an impact investing organization, and one of our sort of longstanding members was Eileen Fisher. And I was thinking about her sort of circular model where she her company um, not only produces sustainable clothing, but also I think buys it back uh, if, and maybe resells it also. Mm -hmm. Do you see that as a sustainable model going forward? Absolutely, absolutely. I think it's really about that whole thing where I talked about earlier about the industrial approach to like circular and cradle to cradle um, ways of manufacturing and producing clothes. Is that like, you know, we have to think about like once the, we're done with the clothing piece, where does it go? And companies like Eileen Fisher make it easier on us to be able to say, okay, this no longer works for me. I can actually take it back to Eileen Fisher and not only will she pay me back for it, but it could also go back into the production process and have a second life. So yes, absolutely. I also say, I think that a lot of the resale um, uh, platforms are also one of the ways that I think is like actually a circular model. So for example, um, I think it's, uh, what is it called? Um, in, in France, it's Bestiaire Collective, uh, but there's a, a version in the US and I'm, it's, it's, it's escaping my mind, but essentially luxury resale platforms or even ThreadUp, which is uh, an American company, they, um, they just, it's just regular everyday clothes, but they are, they were able to just kind of photograph it for you and put it online. So if you're looking for something specific, because sometimes if you need a black pant, it's kind of hard to search for that on a secondhand market because you just never know what you're going to get on a secondhand market. But a platform like ThreadUp, you can actually Google, can I, a black pant? And then all of these options will come up. So again, I think just being able to like work with what we have now instead of buying new all the time, uh, we need to normalize that as part of our practice because I think the initial thing that we think about, oh, I need this, we go to the store and buy something completely new for it. But for me, when I think about what I need something, I mean, sometimes there's an emergency and I need something and I, I, you know, I also have to kind of go the, the last minute route, but as much as I can, I try my best to prepare ahead of time and try to get everything secondhand if possible. My boots are actually um, second, from the secondhand resale market as well. So I'm not just, you know, just wanting to demonstrate that it's uh, the practice that I also employ in my own um, uh, uh, fashion uh, belief system and, and, how I, and how I consume myself. So, yeah, thank you. It was so, so wonderful, Ruby. I knew it would be. And I just can't thank you enough community and this is just a little something from Truckee Meadows Community College and I would like to make sure I'm accurate on this Dr. Hilderson I believe we're the only community college who keeps the word community is that right and that makes me very proud and I hope so this is from our community college Yay. from our community thank you so, so. much thank you so so much thank you so much for having me Thank you everyone and thank you. So happy you were here and we all share this together. All right, so. Um. Bonsoir. <laughs> <laughs>